Welcome to Growing Storytellers, a helicopter stories podcast for anyone who works with children aged two to seven years old. I'm Trisha Lee. And I'm Isla Hill. And today in this podcast, we are going to be continuing on our journey uh, of looking at the connections between helicopter stories and the EYFS framework. And as last time we were looking at communication and language, we are also doing that today, but we're moving on to another early learning goal, which is expressing ideas. And I got quite excited about uh, this one when I saw it coming up next, because it made me instantly think of Trisha's new book, um, which is actually new books, because they are a trilogy. They are picture books. So a, a, a different uh, type of book from, from the one we're used to, um, which are to be read to children. And they explore through story the different, some of the different problems that may crop up when doing helicopter stories regularly with children. And the one that it made me particularly think of is one called I Can't Remember, because the whole idea of expressing ideas is great if you can. And sometimes it's difficult for children to get those ideas out to express them. And this story is all about what happens when that goes wrong, when you can't get your ideas out. And uh, and Trisha explores that in the book, I can't remember. Trisha, I thought you might like to say a bit more about that. Yeah, well, I think for me, it's that thing. We all know the child who you ask if they want to tell a story and they're there going, me, yes, I do. Yes, I do. And then they come and sit down to tell you their story. And their face goes blank. And you look at them and you think, they don't know what they're going to say. And you're there sort of going, okay, should we just have a think? And I used to do that all the time. Let's have a think. Okay. And then after a while, I'd always say, well, do you want to come back later and come and tell your story? And I remember talking to Vivian Gussin Paley about this and because I never felt right about it. I never felt it always felt a bit like it was an awkward moment. And then sometimes I go, oh, maybe it's OK. They've come and they've sat here for a little while and maybe that was enough. But actually, there was I kept thinking, is there another way? Is there a better way that I could be doing this? And Vivian said that she would never send a child away when they come forward, but she would do what children do in play is she'd ask their friends to help. And so she would call up other children to come and sit around and help to actually, you know, what might be in the story. So she may go, Millie, I don't play with Amanda, so I don't know what's in her story. So what character do you think might be in a story that she would tell? And the children, two or three children, would have an idea and maybe a princess or maybe it's a monster or maybe it's a house and, you know, sort of with with magic going in the windows. I don't know. Could be anything. And um, the person whose story, who's telling the story will go, oh, yeah, I want a princess. And then they're ready to start their story because they've been helped by their friends. And I've tried it a few times or several times now in classrooms and it works so well because it just takes the pressure off the child. So that's what the picture book I can't remember is all about. It's looking at how a child in a classroom who can't remember, who desperately wants to tell a story is helped by their friends to remember the story they wanted to tell and to find their own example of a story. So that's where where that all comes from. And it's really interesting, that thing, isn't it, about where does creativity and those story ideas come from? And what is creativity? What is a unique idea or an original story? And there's, I write about this a bit in my latest book, The Growth of a Storyteller, but there is a um, It's a really complex thing. We might often say to a child, come up with an original idea. Tell me your story. But actually, there's no such thing as an original idea. There is no such thing as an original idea. Mark Twain says that um, 
what it is, is we pick all different ideas, like a kaleidoscope of ideas, and we put them all in a pot and mix them around. And that's where we take out. So we all have our own ingredients. We're throwing our own stuff into this pot. And um, Elizabeth Gilbert, who is the author of Eat, um, Pray, Eat, Love, Pray, she does a TED Talk, which is, has to be one of my all-time favourite TED Talks, where she talks about this idea of the elusive creative genius and what is it and where does creativity come from? And she starts the TED Talk by saying, supposing your best work is done and you're never going to be able to do that again because her book was so successful. It's like, I've done it now. That is my most successful. And suddenly there's a huge pressure. Everyone wants the next thing, but maybe that was it. That was her genius. So she began to look at how people used to think of creativity. And in ancient Rome and in ancient Greece, um, they didn't used to think that creativity was the responsibility of the person it was like a spiritual deity that would come to you and it lived in the walls. And in ancient Rome, they called it your genius. So your genius would show up. And if your genius, it's like your muse, I suppose. But if your genius showed up, you'd be able to write or you'd be able to paint or you'd be able to do your work. But people wouldn't praise you. They'd praise your genius. So you're not going to get big headed and you're not going to go, it's all about me. It's like, wow, my genius was really functioning well that day. You know, they came in up, they were there for me. But also it's not your fault if you can't do it because your genius hasn't shown up. And I think that's really interesting is like, you know, it's not there. My spiritual deity, my creativity is not here today. And sometimes I see that with children. It's like you see they turn up, they come and sit beside you, but their genius hasn't shown up that day. Their creativity and they're like going, yeah, come on, help me. So you get their friends to work as their creative deity genius and they can help them out and sort them. So, yes, I think that's, you know, sort of really key within how we think about creativity and expressing ideas. Yeah. And equally, it's that thing, isn't it? If most of the time, a child sits next to you, and I'm always amazed that as soon as I say, "Okay, hey, tell me your story," it's there. You know, it's just, it's just so incredible that it's there. I did have a boy the other day say to me, "I'm going to have to have a think. I'm not sure what my story is today," but you know, real confidence in that because he's been doing helicopter stories, you know, since he was three, and he's now going into year one, so he's got lots of experience of like. I'm going to have to have a think about this. I'm not sure what my story is. I'm like, okay. And yeah, we just yeah. sat there and had a thing. And it didn't take long. It was very relaxed, very chilled, very kind of like, I know that it will come. I just need a minute. You know, <laughs> it was great. Just and waiting for just, my, my elusive genie to show up. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be really shocked if he said that. <laughs> but it's also, it's interesting, isn't it, where ideas come from? Because... Because actually that notion of borrowing them and kind of taking them from lots of different places is really key. And if you look at it, I mean, I've seen that and I'm sure you've seen this too, Isla, when you're doing stage one, when we with stage one, we introduce the approach to the children around the stage. And part of that is actually getting the children to tell us stories in stage two. They tell us stories around the stage. And one of the things that I often notice is that maybe the first child will go pumpkins in their story if it's coming up to Halloween or something. And then the next story will go pumpkins and a ghost. And maybe that comes into their story. And then maybe the third story will be ghost and monster. And then the fourth story might go pumpkins, ghost, monster, you know what I mean? And incorporate them all. But you see these links and it's not just the, the characters they borrow. There can be whole phrases crept behind a tree. And then five stories later, because they're hearing each other, you've got crept behind a tree showing in another story. 
Yeah, and that shows the listening attentively, doesn't it, again, to come back to that other communication and language early learning goal of I'm listening that attentively, I can remember that phrase word for word and then incorporate it into my own story. And that, that I think is really exciting and shows a, a, a kind of um, cognitive level that we don't necessarily often see with children it's obviously going on it's obviously there but for them to articulate it for us to actually witness it is quite an exciting yeah. an exciting thing and the borrowing of and the, it also the, the magpieing of stories from each other well that's and it's interesting isn't it it's because they borrow from each other when they um see their stories acted out as well so maybe the next week you know we've talked a bit about that before they'll take an image but also it talks more about why the scribing of stories, you know, as much as possible needs to be a community activity as well, that we can do that with other children gathered around and hearing, or Vivian used to do it at her table, that it's a real community thing. So you are able to borrow and take those ideas from each other and share those stories. But and of course, some of the shyest children only get that opportunity or only find their way in because they've listened to the child who's just gone before them and they go okay she was smiling and nodding she wrote that down it was all good I'm going to do the same story because it's safe I know it works and it's going to be my first story or my my way into my story today because I've been given that confidence by another child and witnessing that moment yeah and that I can express my ideas through the story they've told. I found a connection in that way and I'm able to do it. Yeah, that's really good. And also the other thing is that it's that link to where they get stories from popular culture so that you'll find things like Peppa Pig or The Little Mermaid or Ben 10 or Minions. I seem to get loads of Minion stories at the moment. But you get, you know, sort of a whole range of different characters that the children know and that maybe as an adult it's not my popular culture because my child's not that age anymore so I actually need to go and keep up and find out who it is that they're talking about and seeing that and I think that's really interesting actually in terms of um where children you know because we talk a lot about expressing ideas and being able to you know, re-talk about uh, things that they've heard before, looking at how they, you know, sort of share ideas from before, sharing vocabulary. But it's so important that we actually recognise popular culture, that they're doing that, that they are demonstrating an understanding of stuff that they're receiving and being able to, to show that and, you know, talk about that and share that in the stories. And that's the ideas that they're expressing. Because sometimes I think we can get a bit hung up. Oh, I don't want those stories. I don't want that. I want you to have a new idea. Whereas actually, mm. we should value that they're still expressing ideas, regardless of whether they're kind of popular culture characters that they're talking about in that. Absolutely. And there's evidence again there that they are picking up new vocabulary and then using it. You know, because sometimes there's all sorts of language, isn't there? You know, look at the world of Pokemon, for example. My goodness, scribing Pokemon stories is, is, is incredibly difficult. And you say, sorry, what? Um, and I just end up writing lots of phonetic things that sounds like... Charas, that yeah. <laughs> yeah, all of those. And you're just like, right, OK, I'm just going to keep writing. Um, but they're actually hearing those. And, you know, it, it could be vocabulary, it could be, you know, names that are, you know, characters that are included, and then they're using them in their own stories. So we're, we're seeing evidence of that in popular culture as well. It's not yeah. just, you know, have you incorporated an element of Red Riding Hood in your story? It's actually much broader than that. And, and evidence of that is, is quite wide if we value those stories, the stories that come from Minecraft or the wonderful things that we've enjoyed, I know, over the past couple of years and a bit more when it comes to some of our resources, is sharing with the children some of our own stories from the story basket. So for those of you who don't know, the Story Basket is a collection of audio stories. So there's no visuals to watch as such. Um, we provide word banks for vocabulary that might be unusual to children to give them a little bit of a context for 
for that particular word that might be that might be something that they've not heard before. Other than that, there's nothing to watch um, as such. And children uh, need to practice that skill. You know, they're not necessarily very good at it straight away. The whole listening to audio stories is a skill. Um, but the one thing that we've noticed is that they listen to the stories. So we, we get them to listen to the same story over a couple of weeks. They might hear it three or four times. And you begin to see them borrowing ideas and expressing ideas that are contained within those stories, in their own storytelling. And this is one of the wonderful things about helicopter stories, is that you can really see if a particular idea or um, piece of vocabulary you want them to work on or a story that you've You've, you've introduced, whether or not that's really landed and connected with those children. Does it come out in their own storytelling? And I don't necessarily mean retelling that story, but also just borrowing that idea or yeah. borrowing that phrase from that story that they then use for their own. And just recently, we've had some great uh, evidence of, of those stories, the ideas, the vocabulary, popping up in children's own helicopter storytelling. Um, a favourite of mine recently came from Chicken Lickin, because Chicken Lickin obviously is quite repetitive and, and uh, the children get used to the structure of the story very quickly because Chicken Lickin visits uh, or, or comes across, not visits, comes across each animal and says, oh, the sky's calling down, calling down, falling down, the sky's falling down and they run off to, to tell the king. And uh, in that, in the recording that's in the story basket, um, each time Chicken Licking turns up, he's uh, sort of shouting, tragedy, calamity, the sky is falling down. And uh, my class got really into the dramatics of that um, and enjoying the whole uh, uh, shouting and all of that but in that they they learned some really great words of things like tragedy calamity disaster and started to use them and then uh one of the children retold chicken licking and put tragedy and calamity in the retelling of that which i thought was just amazing for such unusual words quite tricky words um to be incorporated into a four-year-old's vocabulary, I thought was quite impressive. So that was actually a retelling. But other ideas like um, in a king's new clothes, borrowing one element and putting that into a story. So one of the boys took the element of a parade. And that's quite an unusual thing. You think about it, we don't really have parades very much mm -hmm. in, in, in our sort of day-to-day -day lives, shall we say. And... Um, Obviously, there's a parade in the king's new clothes when he wears his clothes and goes out in the street or doesn't wear his clothes, more to the point. And um, there's a parade. And then one of the stories told immediately after listening to that was a parade that was uh, for was of the superheroes. And the parade was for all the people the superheroes had saved. And I just thought, wow, what a wonderful uh, understanding of what a parade is and then reusing it to make it into a really nice, nice moment in in their own story. I love yeah, that. Yeah, it's, it's so important. And we talk about, you know, if we want children to express their ideas, to be able to really create rich stories, they need to have a language rich environment. They need to be surrounded, which is why we created the story basket and why reading loads of different stories and telling, orally telling stories to children is such an important thing and goes so well alongside helicopter stories in that way. Because the other thing that's really important is that, that we then begin to see children as storytellers developing. So we see the ideas that they've borrowed, we see where they're getting their own stories from, what's happening in their lives, how bits of that feed in. And initially, it might just start as a one word story and then move on to a list story. One word can be one character and that's the hero arriving. So you might just have mummy and that's the hero, you know, but it's also the safe place. We know mummy, that's safe. Or it might be horsey or cow or something like that. And that's the hero arriving. 
And then gradually they bring in more people. They bring in their characters. And then finally something happens. But it's a storytelling journey. And that's something that goes on their growth as storytellers. And I think the more we can share with children, the more language rich environment we can give them, the more chance that we have that our children will be able to grow as storytellers and that we'll really get excited about the ideas that they're expressing. So that's all for this podcast, but we look forward to going deeper next time. I'll see you then. Bye.